putting people in the same room with different disciplines and different ideas and the opportunity for cross-pollination really has the chance of bringing about something new and something interesting. Working out how you can get ideas to have wide attraction, how you can get ideas to fly. My words were resonating with people. I realized that I was speaking a truth. One way or another, it's really fascinating to me that the telegraph moment and the internet moment are really related to each other. I think that there are ways in which they might actually say something to us about a more useful way in which we can be talking to each other. The question of how you have a workplace that is not using sex for power is a question that isn't just for campuses, but is across the world. I think antibiotic resistance is going to be one of the biggest problems of the next hundred years. I and mean, we're entering a time where common infections are killing people. And the more drugs that we use, uh, the more resistant the bacteria become. We're working with some of the most brilliant minds in the nation. And so one of the endeavors of what we're all doing together is to invest in that brain power, much of which is absent from the public conversation. What could we do and what would be the return to society if we could invest in all those missing voices and missing ideas? I have to pause for a minute and think about uh, what it would feel like and sound like if it was 50-50 women, men commenting in the public sphere. I think it would mean that people would actually have to listen to each other. I do feel like I have a moral obligation to share what I know. Part of that comes from being a physician, but also just comes from being a member of humanity. And I, I feel like we all have the duty, if we know things or have information that could improve people's lives or save people's lives, to share that information and get it out into the world. Diana and I wrote a piece on college freshmen and um, was published in the Washington Post. So I'm a research psychologist, she's a clinical psychologist. We are working on some of the same issues. These reports was stunning even me. I was working on a scientific paper on bullying and when I started to do some cross-national comparisons, I started to realize that American children are doing so poorly compared to children in other countries. The reason we wrote about college freshmen is there's an uptick in depression and anxiety on college campuses. At the Center for Emotional Intelligence here at Yale, we are working really hard to develop high school curriculum. Public Voices is my experiment in trying to shape that dialogue according to uh, what we're discovering in science. Because of negotiations and contracting between pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies, not only are the medicines getting more expensive, I think there's not an awareness of the fact that that's happening, and it could be a matter of life and death. Women make up a minority of the criminal justice population, so the idea was to draw attention to their specific issues and what types of care they should receive and what are the best ways to deliver that care. This knowledge that we've acquired throughout the years is helping the development of new therapies for cancer. I had gone on a um, PBS interview with Douglas Blackman, uh, who works on, on incarceration and slavery, and I got two letters from prison inmates. One said to me, I felt like I was sent here not to be punished, but to be destroyed. And so it really reaffirmed, like, I do need to speak this message because somebody heard it that day in the dark halls of a prison and it resonated with him and he was empowered in that moment. Literally, I spent time in the shower thinking, how could I say this in a funner way? What would I tell someone at a cocktail party that I work on? The Yale Press people wrote a press release on the study I wrote the title, Why Don't the Highly Educated Smoke? And that piece has been what people picked up on from the press release on Reddit in interviewing me on NPR. And so that has been uh, really powerful for me. The piece was picked up by a foundation called the Sjogren's uh, Foundation. They have a fellowship in palliative care. One of the program officers from that foundation approached me, which she said, we want leaders like you to apply. 
got retweeted all over the place. I got people emailing me that they received this three and four times, and I was interviewed by some radio stations. Somebody wants to do a documentary on this, and I'm like, this is... It matters because their ideas are really important. Criminal justice, gun violence, sexual assault, these are high stakes issues. What if our ideas could go further and faster than we could imagine, than we could wrap our heads around? Who would we reach and how would we change those people's lives and by extension the world? Disparate voices from around campus have come together. It's about bringing thought leadership to the public. This program has given me much, a much better sense of my capacity to reach a much larger population of people, and that's, that's very exciting. I think that Yale is doing this, is reaffirming to its undergrad population, to its graduate population, to the world, that the experts to be listened to is a much more diverse set than we normally have. The real need now is to expand the conversation up to the leadership level of every profession, every organization, because that's where the impetus for true change is going to come from.